good afternoon or good morning, depending on whatever time zone you're all in. Uh, greetings, this is um, Saurav Arunachalam with the UNC Institute for the Environment and host of the um, CMAS or the Community Modeling Analysis System Center. Um, today, we are going to hear from two of our EPA colleagues on um, AMET. AMET is the Atmospheric Model Evaluation Tool. They're going to give an overview of AMET version 1.4 that was just released. And the two speakers today are Robert Gilliam and Wyatt Appel. Uh, Rob and Wyatt work in the Atmospheric Environmental Systems Modeling Division or AESMD in EPA's Office of Research and Development. They both received their master's degrees in atmospheric science from North Carolina State University in Raleigh, North Carolina. Rob and Wyatt collectively have over 30 years of experience working for EPA and have focused a large portion of the time on the evaluation of meteorological and air quality models. Rob's primary area of focus is on the development and evaluation of the WERF and MPAS meteorological models, while Wyatt has focused primarily on the evaluation of the CMAC model, which is also developed and released by ORD's AESMD. Before I turn it over to Rob and Wyatt, um, um, just some protocols. So we have Rob and Wyatt first present, and we'll wait for them to go through the slides. In the meanwhile, uh, if you have any questions, I suggest that you all start typing um, your questions on the chat box. Um, please use the Q&A portion of the chat window and that'll go directly to um, the panelists. And please use the Q&A portion of the um, software to type in your um, questions. And we will respond to them after Rob and White have gone through the slides. With that, thank you, Rob and White, for doing this today. And I'll turn it over to you. All right, thanks, Rob. Appreciate it. Um, first, thank everyone. Uh, thank you to everyone for joining today. Um, it's nice to uh, be able to come and talk about um, this tool and um, how it can help uh, in people's evaluation needs. Um, so today, uh, as Rob said, um, back in August, not too long ago, Rob and I released the latest version of AMET, uh, version 1.4. Um, so today we'll just kind of give an overview of what AMED is, you know, basically how it works, and then go over some of the new features that we added in version 1.4. Um, so just a, a quick brief history of how this, you know, came about. Um, actually, Rob was the first one to do this uh, way back in uh, the mid-2000s. Uh, when he started uh, evaluating meteorological models and needed a way to organize things and evaluate uh, those runs quickly. So that was kind of early AMET and uh, shortly after that I joined and kind of extended it to the air quality side to include CMAC. Uh, then in 2008 we actually released the first version um, through CMAS um, and then it was uh, shortly followed by version 1.1 in May. Uh, to update and make some minor changes. Uh, and then it was a, there was a pretty big break, uh, five years until we released version 1.2, uh, which was a, um, a relatively minor update to AMET at that time. And then uh, just two years ago, back in 2017, we released version 1.3, which actually was a pretty significant update. Uh, we uh, originally, AMET was written with a lot of Perl code, um, and we went ahead and uh, removed that since it was becoming um, a bit difficult to deal with. So we removed that and rewrote everything in R. Um, and then uh, just a couple months ago, we released version 1.4, which uh, basically included a lot of things that we didn't get in the 1.3 release. Um, and then uh, some, some new capabilities that we wanted to add. So just to, for those who aren't familiar, or maybe for those who are, just um, you know, like like seeing it, uh, a general overview of what AMED is. So it's a, a model evaluation tool for both air quality and meteorological models. We're primarily focused on uh, WARF and MPAS on the MET side. MM5 is no longer supported. I don't know if anyone still uses MM5, but um, we don't have support for that in the latest version. And then on the air quality side. It's primarily CMAC, but uh, with a, if you can post-process your CAMEX data into uh, IO API, you can easily use it with uh, AMET as well. It utilizes um, 
open source software, so none of this is proprietary. You can just go and download. So the, uh, we use a MySQL database for storing model and observation data. Uh, there's a, some code that's written in Fortran for processing the CMAC data. And then most of the code is written in R, which does all the interfacing with the database uh, and does the analysis and create statistics. Um, some of the advantages of AMET, at least that we feel are advantages, um, it's capable of managing large data sets efficiently. Since we use a database, you can store and access and query these data uh, relatively easily. It's partially automated, so we have a lot of scripts that, that take care of some of the more tedious parts of doing model evaluation. Um, as I said, the relational database that we use allows for unique querying, so you're not um, you know, just limited on um, you know, dates and sites and things like that. You can actually do some pretty clever um, querying of your data. Uh, there's a number of predefined analysis scripts for common analysis across groups, so uh, if, if people are using Different people are using AMET. These are plots and things that people would be familiar with seeing, which sometimes makes communicating easier across groups. Um, and then kind of lastly, users can easily develop their own custom code if they're familiar with R. Uh, there's kind of a, uh, it's pretty easy to, to, to learn R and then start messing around with things, especially if you have a, have a basis for it already. Um, so you can kind of leverage your output files to do your own analyses. Um, on the right is just a flow chart of how AMET works and quite just very simply, we take observational data um, from generally routine observation networks such as MATIS um, or a number of air quality networks like AQS. We then pair those with uh, model data in time and space. We store those data in a database um, and then we use the R code to access and create uh, various plots and statistics using those data. Here's just a very, um, yeah, well, it just shows the directory structure of the data of the AMET code that's on GitHub. I'm not here to, to go over this, but, but very simply we have um, documentation, uh, places where you would store model and observation data, output, then there's the analysis code, database code, um, and then all the scripts that you would use to um, analyze and evaluate your data. So um, everything you need to do, your analysis is there. There's, there's complete documentation, a user's guide, quick start guide. Um, I'll go over this later. But all the documentation um, and code that you need is right there uh, in the archive. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll talk about that later on toward the end of how to get AMET and uh, what's actually included in there. Um, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Rob. So Rob handles the, the MET side of AMET. I will uh, come back and talk about the air quality side um, after Rob uh, tells you about the MET side. Okay, thanks, Wyatt. Uh, <clears throat> okay. So uh, this is this first slide, at least for the meteorology focus part of this talk, uh, is just an illustration of some of the plotting uh, abilities uh, of the canned analysis scripts that we have, just a little bit of eye candy, I guess, to show you what it can do. I'll, I'll talk about some of these and specifically uh, because some of them are new. I won't get into uh, the plots that, and analyses that were older, uh, but we'll focus on some of the new capabilities in AMET 1.4. And uh, just to, to start on that, these are some of the key updates uh, that we put in AMET this year, or it's been the last uh, year or so that we've uh, been working on this. Uh, so, uh, Prior, uh, AMET 1.3 was uh, solely based on surface meteorology. Uh, we did not have uh, any any upper upper air evaluation or evaluation of upper air meteorology. So we uh, leveraged the MATIS uh, RAYOP data set to uh, come up with a few ways to look at the meteorology above the surface. Uh, 
Uh, we also leveraged a uh, global uh, surface radiation network to look at uh, solar radiation in, in the MET models and uh, added a script that allows you to evaluate precipitation on a daily and monthly basis using the PRISM uh, data set. And also, uh, this, this is actually something that's not in 1.4 yet, but we're going we're gonna to update uh, GitHub very soon. So if this uh, is relevant to any of your model domains, uh, you may want to uh, get in contact with us if you need this now, or it were to be updated uh, in the next uh, few weeks on the GitHub. But uh, we, before uh, we, a met at least on the met side was only compatible with Lambert conformal projections. We had a, a project here where we needed to look at a Mercator projected uh, domain, so we added that in and went ahead and added the ability to uh, to uh, evaluate polar stereographic and lat lawn. And these are all the projections that are in uh, the standard version of WARF. So everything uh, in WARF now is is compatible with AMET. Uh, also, we added uh, an evaluation of surface moisture time series, and I'll show a plot of this in a little bit. And we uh, made the database uh, population a little bit faster on the MET end, especially when uh, you're using uh, data sets like the Mesonet data set that have a lot of sites. So the, I, I wanted to briefly touch uh, a, a review, and this is actually at the top. It says AMET 1.4, uh, but it should be actually 1.3. Uh, this, this is a review of what we did in the previous version. And I, I just wanted to show this because there were some pretty big changes, and, and as Wyatt hinted to, AMET started, uh, at least the model matching uh, was done in Perl originally, and there were some uh, math libraries and NetCDF uh, modules in Perl that uh, were not being updated, uh, basically old and did not work on certain systems. People were having problems. So we went ahead and uh, removed all the Perl stuff, and everything is done in R now. Uh, so the model matching is, is all done in R, and, and all the analyses are done in R. So we kind of removed that, uh, which there were a lot of, uh, not a lot, but a few extra programs that we needed, uh, and you need to download and compile on your system. So it just made things uh, a lot more seamless, a lot easier to install, go into all R. Uh, and the other uh, thing we did was uh, we used this MATIS uh, observational data set. And uh, prior, we had this uh, ex executable that you'd run, and it would extract data from the MATIS NetCDF files into a text form, and then we would read that in. Uh, but uh, we removed that to direct reading of the NetCDF MATIS file, so that kind of streamlined things a little bit. And also, uh, we're working on uh, global modeling now with our next generation modeling system using MPASS. So we made uh, we made AMET compatible with the MPASS grid, and uh, we also did some simplification of project table database management. Uh, we had have an auto FTP option that uh, will get the uh, meteorolo meteorology data and radiation data for you. So you just give it a, essentially give it a war for an input pass output file. It looks at the times and gets the correct observations to match with the model. So that makes it very easy to, uh, to evaluate your model runs. And some, uh, we do some better site accounting, uh, and I won't get into a lot of details of that, but it makes it more efficient and run it makes it run faster too. So okay, so the first part of this is uh, as Wyatt indicated, we have kind of two parts of the AMET meteorology and air quality 
uh, components. Uh, one is you have to match the uh, model output with observed data, and uh, then you have to, then you want to analyze the data. So we split that to start with the model matching with observations in the meteorology now. Uh, on the meteorology side, we have three main scripts. One is matching surface data. One is matching RAOB or upper air uh, meteorological observation profiles uh, with with the model, and the and the third is matching BSRN, which is baseline surface radiation network. Uh, so you can run any of these, and uh, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail here because because this isn't a tutorial, but uh, at the the slide shows a lot of settings that are pretty common across uh, these three scripts. Uh, there may be a slightly different uh, options, a few extra options for for the RAOB and the uh, BSRN, but in general, uh, you give it some uh, details about your MySQL server, uh, a database that you want to put the data into, uh, a project uh, we call AMET project, which is your run ID that you, you want to evaluate, uh, kind of a code name for your model run, uh, description, uh, location of model output, location of your MATIS observational data, et cetera. So, uh, and you can see on the, on the right-hand side, there's a section, I just highlight a few interesting or more interesting parts of this, but there's an auto FTP, so we give you two different servers that uh, you can download this MATIS observational data to relieve you of any, any need to download observations. So once you do, uh, once you, you uh, configure that, uh, you run, run these, you know, any of these scripts or all of these scripts, and it has your, it, it'll do the matching of your model, of course, with the observations. There's a few suggestions on here. Uh, for you know, verbose. If you want more uh, information, I'll put it to the screen. Uh, and you want to update your sites in, in the database. Uh, that is important for your analysis part. Uh, but once you do this, you have uh, all all the observations that were in these uh, in these ops files that were within your domain are now matched with your model and uh, they're in, in the MySQL database. So the next step is to, uh, is to analyze that data. And uh, we have, um, you know, basically we give you a template directory for a project and you copy that uh, to your new project name and you start from there and you have all these different scripts. There's eight canned analysis scripts for uh, spatial statistics, time series, time series uh, relative humidity, which uh, is the new moisture time series that I talked about earlier, uh, summary statistics, daily statistics, uh, short wave radiation plots, uh, the run ray op there is to, is to do upper air analysis, and I'll go into more detail on that in a few. And this run prism is to do uh, evaluation of your model precipitation uh, compared to, to prism. And similar to uh, pairing the model uh, data with the observations, uh, for these analysis scripts, there's a lot of common settings, and they're, you know, essentially the location of your AMET distribution on your platform, uh, your database, your project name, uh, you know, you want PDF or PNG. So there's some common settings. I'm not, not going to go through each one of them, but uh, just to kind of give you an idea of how you run these analyses. So uh, I'm going to, as mentioned, I'm going to focus on the new analyses, uh, but I will give you uh, an example of this older one, which is one we use quite a bit, the uh, surface, uh, basically spatial statistics, and you give uh, essentially a date range. Uh, you can give a threshold of the number of model ops pairs before the statistics are uh, considered. Below that number of pairs, uh, 
you know, the data is ignored or the site is ignored. It helps you weed out sites where there's only a few observations. Uh, you give a, a bounds, uh, basically a lat lawn box that you want to, your spatial plot to show. And uh, you have some options for uh, output text files, uh, R data files, figures. Uh, and uh, this, this essentially gives you a, uh, a plot for uh, two meter temperature mixing ratio, 10 meter wind speed and direction, and it gives you plots for RMSE, mean absolute error bias, uh, index of agreement or correlation, and it'll, uh, as I said before, it'll give you a text uh, CSV file if you want to output and, and kind of import it into your own application to, to do your own plotting. Uh, this, uh, so the time series it was, has been an AMET from the beginning. Uh, it's important if you want to look at specific sites or groups of sites to see how the model performed, you know, on an hourly basis in a time series fashion. And uh, we, we added this uh, time series underscore RH script, which uh, it, it takes, it keeps the temperature and uh, mixing ratio from the original time series plots, but it, it uh, removes the wind direction and wind speed uh, part of the time series and, and does relative humidity and, and station pressure. Uh, so you can look at more moisture uh, relevant variables. We, we did this because of a, a project we were looking at how the model uh, simulates fog. So we wanted relative humidity uh, as uh, a variable that we could evaluate. Uh, so this was added. Uh, and again, you can get text uh, outputs of these so you could plot, uh, you know, yourself in a different application or in R if you wanted to redo the plot for a, for a paper or something like that. You have all the data you need. Uh, so this is new as well. Uh, all of these are, are new. Uh, and it's it's... Uh, gives us the ability to evaluate upper air meteorology and uh, the main variables are temperature. In one plot, we convert that to, to potential temperature, but in the other plots, uh, it's, it's temperature. Uh, we also look at RH, relative humidity, and winds. And there's a bunch of different options. Uh, the way the MATIS RAOP data is set up, uh, is is a little bit different. They have uh, the data on both mandatory pressure levels, and then then they have the full profile, uh, uh, the observed uh, balloon sounding that is on uh, a bunch of different levels, and it changes with each uh, sounding. It's not set, so we elected to uh, separate these out so we could look, do analyses on mandatory pressure levels uh, and uh, we, could, uh, we could also look at uh, the data on their native levels. So you'll see plots that, that come out as uh, like uh, the, there's profiles that have a, a capital M next to them and then there's plots uh, this curtain plot that has an N next to it, which uh, capital N, which stands for native, and the uh, capital M is, stands for mandatory. So there's there's different plots, but I'll just go through a few of these. Uh, so on the top left, you have spatial plots. You can give it a time period and a pressure uh, layer. So you could look at one specific pressure level, like 850 millibars or you could say include all the data from 1,000 millibars all the way up to 100 millibars or 50 millibars, and it'll give you these statistics of mean absolute error, RMSE, uh, bias, and uh, correlation of that uh, profile, uh, or at that, each of those sites, it'll put that in a spatial map so you can see how, how the sites compared, so it's an average 
the average statistics over over a layer and not just uh, one level, or it could be one level if you wanted it to, but there's a lot of flexibility there. You could look over, uh, next to it on the right are, are statistics from all of these profiles combined, and you could see that, uh, well, it's hard to see, but it goes from 1,000 millibars up to about 100 millibars. So you actually, you could, it, the plot on the right separates all of those statistics out into a profile plot. So you can see how the model does at different layers in the atmosphere. In this case, you see that the error gets larger as you get up towards the tropopause or the top of the troposphere. Uh, and just, just to stress, the, these Profile statistics are for all the sites in the domain that you choose. So you get a lat lawn bound. Uh, you can actually, I'm sorry, I, uh, it's actually you can give it a group of sites. You can say all sites, or you can just look at one site and it'll do these profile statistics. So it's pretty flexible, uh, and and I think you know powerful. Uh, to, to see how well your model's performing above the surface, uh, you know, above the standard 2 meter and 10 meter uh, meteorology that we typically look at. Uh, another plot is, uh, I'll, I'll just continue to the right at the top, we have these relative humidity histograms. These were done to look at cloud cover. So over a layer that you choose, or the whole troposphere, or one pressure level, you can uh, look at how the distribution of, uh, you can look, essentially look at the distribution of observed values for relative humidity and the modeled values for relative humidity, and it, I think, is uh, a good way to see how well your model's handling, uh, you know, for instance, the higher relative humidities, 90, 100 uh, percent, would be an indication of how well your model's picking up uh, clouds. Uh, we have a, uh, a these curtain plots, uh, and this would be, I'll go ahead, just on the bottom right is a curtain plot that has the model values over, and this was for a one-month period, looks like March, probably uh, 2016, and uh, you, it, 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 it's basically plotting potential temperature in this case of so the model as a background color shaded plot and the actual sounding uh, locations are plotted over top of that with circles with the same color code. So it gives you a good idea of, uh, you know, how well your model is act sim simulating actual events. You can, you know, we had a field study in, in Kansas back in 2017, so we looked at 10 days, and this was pretty helpful to see how the model uh, captured the boundary layer, for instance. Uh, and on the bottom left, uh, there's curtain plots on the on the uh, on the mandatory pressure levels uh, of both the model and observations. Uh, and when I say curtain plots, to those uh, not not aware, that's uh, in this case that's a height versus time. So it's like a, a time height uh, uh, time series essentially. Uh, and then on the bottom. Uh, is is a time series of different statistics, error and bias over a, a period of time. So in this case, it's all the sites within the, our continental 12 kilometer domain, and it tells you on each day and each sounding what the RMSE uh, of, in this case, I think it's bias of temperatures. It's hard for me to see that, but uh, no, it's RMSE of temperature. Sorry, on the top. So you can see how uh, you know your RMSC in the model uh, over the full troposphere. Or you could pick out one layer uh, or one level and see how that evolves over time. So good way to to evaluate your upper air meteorology. 
in this case, the statistics are pretty pretty good. It's because we're using nudging in our runs, uh, just a, a sidebar there. Uh, so the, the next one is shortwave radiation, and uh, I, I included the BSRN sites um, map on, on the left there, and that just, because we're getting, again, in the global modeling, we want to be able to evaluate the model over the world. So uh, there's a lot of sites in the U.S. that are part of the SURFRAD network, and, and I'll be a little bit more brief on this. Uh, in, in this case, you can do time series at a specific site of the model and observe shortwave radiation. You can do diurnal plots. Uh, you could do spatial plots of bias, uh, you know, mean absolute error. And you can also look at histograms of the modeled and observed uh, shortwave radiation distribution, uh, basically, to see if your, you know, model's biased on the low end or the high end. Of the observed uh, observed radiation, and and to to end this uh, the meteorology part of this, uh, we have this Prism data set, and this is the weakness of this is that it's just over the U.S. So we're looking at other data sets for global uh, precipitation, uh, and we're actually looking at doing point precipitation, uh, look, you know, using point observations in the future uh, as well. But uh, PRISM is daily or monthly uh, gridded at four kilometer uh, lat lawn grid, and these are regridded to your war for impasse grid. And, uh, and it essentially what, what I did with this was instead of providing you with plots of precipitation, it, it makes a net CDF file uh, in the same format as your, as your meteorology model, whether it's WAR for impasse format, and it only has two variables. It has model and observed precipitation. So if you're evaluating January of 2016, it'll give you an output file with precipitation from the model and uh, PRISM for January 2016, and you can pull it open that in any of your visualization software, uh, Verde, uh, Viz5D, NCView, and you can create plots that way. And that way the user has a lot of flexibility with how things look. So, uh, And you can uh, post-process. I have a few scripts where you can take monthly files and, uh, you know, accumulate them up to annual precipitation and, and look at things that way. And give uh, the script also gives you uh, output statistics on on the grid error and bias. So that's uh, that ends the meteorology updates. Hopefully uh, that was useful, and I'll be here for any questions at the end. All right, thanks, Rob. Appreciate that. A lot of cool new stuff you've added. Um, so. On the air quality side, there were um, just, I'll start with just a quick overview. So it was designed to work directly with the CMAC output. Um, as I said, or what I would like to think is that you could actually, with minor modifications, just, you know, modify it to work with other data. It's not really just limited to air quality data. Same with the MET side. Um, as long as you have kind of paired model op data, you should be able to use it um, to look at different data types. On the air quality side, I directly support a number of routine networks. Uh, these include North American networks like AQS, Improve, CSN, CASNet, et cetera. Um, in Europe, Airbase, AURN, EMEP, um, Agnet, ADM, um, and NAM. Um, on the global side, these are actually new. I don't believe they were in 1.3. Uh, the TOR network, uh, which is a collection of data from across the globe, uh, and then the NOAA ESRL uh, ozone data are also supported there. Um, and I'll talk about where you can get those data in a second. Um, each of these networks is stored separately, so you can compare and contrast performance between the different networks, especially if one's rural versus urban, um, different characteristics of, of the networks. They use different equipment and such, so it's good to keep them separate. Um, and then on the air quality side, I utilize the site compare code. This is actually distributed with 
both AMET and CMAC. Um, this is the Fortran-based utility that pairs model and observations. Um, it requires properly formatted observation files, um, and I'll talk about those here on the next slide. Um, or actually, one more slide after that. So here's just a few examples of some of the plots you can get uh, on the AMET side or on the AQ side. So kind of standard scatter plots, um, uh, box plots. There are some more unique plots like the stacked bar plot, 4 p.m., um, soccer goal plots, uh, et cetera. And uh, I'll cover a few of the newer ones here going forward. Um, a few of the key updates. In, on the air quality side in 1.4. Uh, as I said, I added support for the TOR and NOAA ESRL networks, so those are both global. Um, added support for MPAS output. Um, that's kind of in a beta format, but it is there. Streamlined the database querying function. This was actually more for myself because um, I just needed a, a slick function to do all these things, but it actually um, had an added benefit, which I will talk about in a little bit. Um, project tables are now dynamically generated, so this is getting in the weeds just slightly, but this actually makes adding new networks and species a lot easier than it was in the previous version. So um, if you've struggled in the past, you have new species that you want to add, it, it actually required getting into the code a bit more. Now all of that is done through the header, so it just reads it and creates the, the table um, columns that you need, so it makes that uh, part of AMET a lot easier. Um, also added the ability to read site compare files directly. So what this means is you can actually um, use the air quality side of AMET without the database present. Um, so you don't need to go through the work of installing the database. You can actually do all that analysis and it would just read the CSV files that are generated from site compare um, automatically. Um, the disadvantage of this is that you would lose some of the querying capability that comes along with the database. Um, so there's advantages and disadvantages to going that route. Um, I also added um, many new interactive scripts, which I will talk about in a little bit, but these are actual, instead of static images, these are actually HTML files that um, you can zoom in and out of and mouse over and, um, you know, uh, it, it makes analysis a lot more fun. Um, and then I updated uh, a lot of other versions of some older scripts with more modern uh, R libraries to make them more visually appealing. Um, and then finally, I added the ability to use um, the MET data from, from the meteorological side with many of the air quality scripts. So you can actually um, use the same scripts you would for the air quality side with the MET data, and I'll talk about that briefly a little bit in a bit. Um, so circling back to the air quality observation data files, um, as I said, Site Compare requires properly formatted OBS data. Um, we actually provide these data to you, uh, at least for most of the North American networks. Um, so unlike the MET side, which can actually download MET data directly from MATIS, which is really cool, we do not have that for air quality, so uh, we've done a lot of work generating these um, pre-formatted files that you can just download and use directly with Site Compare and AMET. Um, these are available for 2000 through 2017. Um, 2017 is probably complete, but you might want to check back on that if that's a year that you're interested in looking, of, looking at. Um, and then unfortunately, most of the EU data need to be obtained from the source kind of a, uh, not really a copyright issue, but they prefer you get the data from them and not, uh, not from us. So if you're interested in getting uh, data for the EU, you'll just need to uh, work directly with the source for those data. Um, as for the North American data, these can be obtained uh, through the Google Drive on the CMAS Center website. Uh, there's a couple links there you can use to access them. Um, or you can just browse to the CMS Center and look around and it's there under uh, data download. Um, uh, I'm debating, no, nah, let's not, we'll, we'll skip that one. It's not uh, interesting enough, I think. Um, quickly on what querying abilities are available on the AQ side. So I think Rob already kind of touched on this with some of the options that are available on the MET. 
There's similar options available on the air quality side, but essentially you can do um, a number of different temporal queries. So you can query by specific year, month, day. Um, you can actually do a day of the week. You can do hour of the day, et cetera. Basically any information that's in the database that's temporal, you can use to query your data. Uh, you can do spatial specific queries, MJOs, predefined regions. You can create your own lat long box and just have the sites that are within that box. You can do data specific queries. So you can query on um, particular model ob values, say every um, observation that's greater than 60 parts per billion. You can use that as a criteria and you only return those data. You can also cross query with other data, you know, only show me PM when uh, the organic carbon is above 10 micrograms, something like that. Um, so you, you can be very creative with the type of queries you can do using the database. Um, on the plotting side, many of the plots are customizable. Um, you can control the date ranges, colors, symbols, tile, titles, et cetera, um, without getting into the, the code itself. Those are just options that are available. So uh, you can create visually appealing uh, plots for yourself. Um, this is a, just a breakdown of all the different plots that are available. I'm not going to go through it, but uh, you know, there's box plots, scatter plots, spatial plots, um, a number of different things that are available, and these kind of get added to over time. Um, rarely do I remove anything. I just kind of add more stuff to it. Um, so getting into some of the new things that are available in the 1.4 version, um, I talked about these interactive plots. So here's an example of the interactive time series. This leverages the um, Plotly or the DY, actually this might be the DY graphs package in R, not that it matters to you guys, but um, essentially what this does is it creates an HTML file, which is then zoomable. You can mouse over, you can remove or add traces to this. For example, there's, um, this is plotting concentration and bias. So if you just wanted to look at concentration, you could click off the bias traces. It would then um, reformat the axes and you'd, you'd uh, automatically reformat the axes and you'd be able to just see the concentration. Um, here I've just kind of shown the zoom capability so you can um, draw boxes over temporal periods and zoom in to ranges that you would like to look at. Um, similarly, I've created interactive spatial plots. So kind of the same thing, but on a spatial plot format. Um, so you have a zoom capability. There's mouse over, so you can mouse over particular sites and get uh, what that value is. You can do multiple networks. You can toggle those networks on and off on the fly. Uh, and then you can actually change the base map on the fly as well. So here it's kind of a US street map, but you could put a, a topo map on there. Um, all kinds of, I mean, there's all kinds of maps available. I have a handful of them uh, already coded up that you could add, but it wouldn't be difficult to add other ones going forward. Um, I've improved the stack bar plots. This is just a exa quick example of things that have been improved uh, here. Essentially, uh, the main change is that I've added the capability of just doing more um, bars in the plot. and. Uh, uh, for some of these, you can actually click the uh, different species on and off as well to make analysis um, more appealing. Um, this is a new stacked bar time, stacked bar plot time series. So here I'm doing, um, you're looking at two simulations and the observations for the month of January. So you can see there's about 10 different observations and it's each, uh, each day. So it's a time series of the, um, PM species going through the month of January. Um, so this is another new plot that's available in the latest version of AMET. Uh, there's also interactive uh, box plots as well. This is just an example of one. Uh, again, on these plots, you can zoom in, you can add and remove those traces uh, as you would like. Um, then there's just enhanced plots similar to the one you just looked at. These are static, but um, I think they're more visually appealing than the uh, older box plots that were in on the AQ side. Here's an interactive bin box plot. Again, you can uh, zoom and remove traces um, as you would like. Um, there's a new, what we're calling Kelly plot. This is after our uh, 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 Jim Kelly, who works here, came up with this. Um, so this is available on the AQ side, and it's just plots 
Uh, here I'm showing normalized mean bias uh, split up by uh, NOAA climate region for five different simulations, or you can also do uh, a full year's worth of data looking at the climate regions by season. Uh, so this is just a nice way to visualize a lot of data in a very um, succinct way, I would say. Um, and then I had mentioned that you can use the MET data with air quality with the air quality script. So here's an example where I've taken the spatial plot that's on the air quality side and I've plotted the meteorological data. Um, and this would be, again, something that you could zoom in on, change the base map. For example, on this one I've changed it. I've zoomed into the San Joaquin Valley in California and I've changed the base map to a topo map. Um, so you can see where those MET sites kind of line up uh, spatially in the valley which is a, a nice feature. Um, one other thing that's available on the air quality side is this, what, what we call batch processing. Essentially what this lets you do is in one script create many, many different plots. Um, you can customize which ones you want, uh, but for example, you can turn on all the time series, scatter plots, spatial plots, uh, let this script run and you know, in some amount of time, you would have a directory full of all these plots. Um, they're somewhat customizable, but it is a kind of a canned product. So um, you, if you want to get into specializing it, you would then go to some of the specific plots. But this is a nice way to start plotting. You know, after you have a run completed, you can kick the script off, come back, and then look through uh, all the different plots and, and get a sense of um, how things went. Um, so unfortunately, I had to add this slide very recently. Um, I found a critical error in the AMET code that went out back in August. Um, this I found uh, last week on 11.6. Uh, this error caused the site metadata in the database to, um, to not populate correctly. Um, I should say not populate correctly. Um, this was a result of a missing column definition. So essentially what would happen is uh, your site metadata would never get loaded. Unfortunately, if you're using the database, without the site metadata, the analysis scripts would fail. So um, if you downloaded the, date, the code before then and have struggled or got to a point and said, I give up, um, it may be due to this error. So uh, I have posted a fix on the web page, or you can just simply uh, download the redownload the code. Um, I've uh, pushed that fix to the master code. So unfortunately, I had to add this slide kind of last minute because I found this error toward the end. Um, one last thing I'll touch on um, that I would like to get there that I have not, but if, some, if anyone is particularly interested in this, um, I'd be happy to kind of share it offline. Uh, here at EPA, we actually have a web-based uh, GUI for AMET. It's based on PHP, um, HTML and PHP, um, and it uses kind of a drop-down um, radio button system for creating your queries and accessing data in the database. Um, it, it overlays on top of the AMET e existing release code, so it is something that you could use with mineral, minimal updating. Um, you would have to run an Apache web server since it does use PHP, um, so you'd have to have all that installed. Um, I would like to make eventually a beta version of this available on GitHub. I've not gotten to it yet, but it would be great. Um, but if, if someone is interested in it, um, kind of giving it a, a try, I'd be happy to share uh, the, the code with them. Um, how do you obtain AMET? So the AMET um, resides in a GitHub repository. The link is there. Uh, the latest version is available on your master. We also have the previous versions available. Um, there's release notes, as I said. There's a user's guide, um, an install guide, and a quick start guide, all available. Um, and then at some point, we would like to, if people are interested, add a development space where people could upload their own scripts um, or share data or things like, you know, uh, things like that. It would be great to have uh, user-contributed uh, material on there. Um, again, obtaining AMET and documentation, that's what the GitHub site looks like. All the code is there, the documentations are in docs, 
um, and the front page has links to the current version and other versions. It also lists some of the major updates that went into the latest code. Um, on the future MET evaluation components, Rob was uh, already thinking ahead. Um, he wanted to add an auto AT FTP for the PRISM precipitation evaluation. Uh, it does require reading GIS-based shape files uh, rather than the ASCII text files, um, so there's some more rescripting required before he'd be able to implement that. Um, also looking to modernize some of the older scripts, aren't we all? Um, the ability to filter sites that have different about, uh, elevation in the model, which is a really nice um, uh, way to figure out biases, what might be causing bias between um, model and ob. Point precipitation analysis and statistics, he already touched on that earlier, but that would be really great for uh, evaluating precipitation performance. Um, and then utilize the ACARS profiles in MATIS. Um, that would be great for getting some of these boundary layer profiles that are, that are hard to come by. Um, so that would be a really uh, nice update to have going forward. Um, on the future air quality evaluation improvements, uh, essentially build upon this database list um, ability on the air quality side, since uh, people do seem to have difficulty sometimes installing or managing the MySQL database. Um, also improve several of the new AMET um, AQ scripts. I kind of didn't get to some of the options that are in there. Explore adding more interactive plots. I think that's kind of going forward, that's what we'd like to see. I think it brings evaluation kind of into a more um, you know, modern um, place. Um, improve querying speed, that's always a good thing to do, maybe uh, leveraging some of the databasing index, indexing in the database that's available. And then certainly we want to um, add satellite data to the routine air quality analysis. I'm not sure how we'll do this yet. Um, satellite data presents some specific challenges given its uh, relative size. Uh, but it's something that we'll figure out going forward. And then also adding ozone sun and other upper air analyses to uh, the air quality side. I think it's something that we haven't done, but it would be a nice thing to have in there. Um, and then lastly, just thanks to um, Liz Adams uh, for her extensive code testing and documentation. It's really helpful to have this code tested outside of EPA. Um, it helps us release a, you know, a code that's more, um, more resilient and uh, robust. Uh, Kristen Foley, who is ever available for um, answering questions with GitHub and documentation and things like that. Uh, ben Murphy, who also helped out with GitHub. And then uh, Christian Hogarth, who uh, supports the site compare tools um, that are vital to getting the air quality side of this thing done. Couldn't do that. Uh, couldn't really have this without his support. Um, and I think with that, uh, we'll wrap it up and uh, open it up for any questions that people have. So, thank you. Thank you, Rob and Wyatt. That was very informative and a lot of uh, new and exciting features, especially some of the um, new capabilities for doing interactive analysis. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, we do have a few questions. I answered some of them as you were all talking, um, but, but I left some because I felt um, maybe more useful for either of you or both of you to answer this a bit more in detail. Can, the first one is, can AMET be used to analyze MET air quality model output for China? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. So I think, and Rob can correct me if I'm wrong, but on the, on the MET side, they, I, well, let me, let me put it this way. The answer is yes. Um, there's no geographic limitation to where it can um, do analysis. Um, you know, it's, uh, we've done global networks, it works fine. So yes, the answer is it can. Um, I will say on the air quality side, we've, we have limited data for China. So that's why it's not really included um, you know, it's not highlighted as something that we can do. So most of what we do is based on the North American networks for air quality or, or Europe. And then we have those, those kind of two global networks. So if we were able to get data for China, we'd be happy to um, kind of include it in the data sets that we already include. And then you would just be able to access it as you would any other network 
in AMET. And I think Rob, um, Rob, on the Met side, I don't think there's a limitation for China. No, uh, the only limitation is what what's in this MATIS data set. And over the past decade, they've expanded to include uh, global uh, surface, and they've had uh, global upper air observations. Uh, so uh, it would work just fine. Uh, one of the, I think the first few slides, uh, there was a spatial plot of the globe that showed uh, a number of sites, you know, in, in China and Asia. So, yes, uh, the MET side will work just fine. Okay. Uh, on a related note, another one on uh, outside the U.S. How about air quality data for Canada? Yeah. Yeah, I just saw that. Um, I, and. I, I don't know if maybe I didn't include it or I skipped over it, but um, I actually do include the NAPS data. So NAPS is included for Canada. Um, I have not been able to get the most recent years. So I know that there's data for 2016, but I don't think I have any for beyond that. So I'm kind of waiting for that data, those data to become available. Uh, and when they do, we'll add them to the data sets that we have. But the, the answer is yes. Um, there are data for Canada up until 2016, um, and yeah, the, I, I plot it all the time. It works great. Okay. Um, the next one is PRISM. Um, Rob, this may be for you. So for PRISM precip com comparison, does the user need to have them downloaded beforehand, or do you automatically download as part of AMEC? Uh, there, there's not. Uh, I uh, the PRISM is the only thing that's not automatically downloaded, so you would have to download that data. Uh, in, the, in the script, there's a uh, web address to get the data, and it's a very simple, um, you know, you, you actually have to press a few uh, buttons in a form to choose monthly or daily and which year, uh, and you can download the entire year of uh, monthly data, or the other option is you can download an entire month of daily data. Uh, so uh, very simple to get the data for that. Okay. Um, the next one is, um, can the user reset the colors for PM species in the stack bar charts? I've noticed that you're using colors different than some of us. Yeah, and so this is not the first time I've heard this. And I will tell you that colors are a very difficult thing because everyone uses different colors. Um, I, don't, I don't know if there's any set standard for which colors you should use for which PM species. It seems like um, it, it differs. I will say to answer that question, yes, you can. The, the problem or the difficulty is, is those colors are hard coded into those scripts right now. So you'd actually have to go into those scripts and customize them and change those colors. Um, it's, it's pretty easy to do. It's, it's obvious in there where those colors are indicated and which species they would be mapped to, but it's not something that's easily changed at this point. Um, unlike some of the other colors that are, are options that are already built in, I don't have that for the stack bar, but now that I see that, it would not be difficult to add another option to create your own color scheme for the stack bars. So, yeah. <laughs> um, here's another good one. Uh, is there any plan to release AMEC as an R package? Yeah, this is, um, I've, we've thought about this before, and people have mentioned that this is an available option. Um, I would say that I don't think either Rob or I have pursued this far enough. Um, it's an intriguing thing that we could do, um, and I would probably have to ask someone here who has done that, maybe Kristen. Um, I don't know that she's actually created one, but she might be, she's certainly more familiar with it that process than I am, but um, I think the short answer is yeah. It's it if it's it's something that we could do and we could look into if that would be helpful and it might make getting the the code easier, for sure. Okay, um, can you give a couple of examples of specific AMET scripts used to generate interactive box, time series, spatial maps, and so on? 
Um, so I guess um, there's there are so for each of those there's already scripts that come with the code that you would use to generate like an interactive box plot. It's that script actually already exists, so you would just um, modify it and and run that script. So you don't actually it's already built in there. Uh, same for the time series and uh, time series and spatial plots. Um, so you'd just be able to go ahead and um, run those scripts. They're, they're sitting in the scripts directory. Um, I, hopefully that answers that question of you know how you would do it. Yeah, I think so. If, if um, I'm following the question correctly. <laughs> I think so. Um, okay. I, it, it's a question of um, finding the names of scripts in the documentation and then going from Okay. There. Yeah, it should. So all of the I think in the documentation, any ones that are interactive, I said interactive, um, they're also tagged as in the code as either Plotly or ggplot, because those are the interactive packages I use with, uh, with R. So, okay. But yeah, it's, they're already, they're already kind of labeled as interactive. Yeah. Okay. Um, can you provide more specifics? Um, um, I think this is for Wyatt about limitations of running AMET without MySQL. In the current right. Time. So um, I think the the biggest limitations are some of the querying that can be done. So for example, when you use the database, I have metadata for the sites. So for example, elevation, what state they are in, um, you know, potentially what country they're in. Um, so all of that data is in a separate table that can then be used as querying information when you, when you do a query. When you run without the database, I don't have that right now. It could be added in the future, but right now all I have, all you'd be able to use is what comes in a site compare file, which is essentially uh, the date and maybe some other information, but it's pretty limited. At this point, we may actually include the state for some of them. Um, so it, it's those kind of limitations. Um, those are the limitations you would have when you don't use the database. Um, and, and some of the custom queries like basing it on um, concentration, like I said, 60 parts per billion, you wouldn't be able to do that without the database right now. Um, I just don't have that set up to do that. It, I could do it going forward, but it's just not there right now. Hmm. A um, couple of questions with a similar theme. Um, is there a quick way or any documentation instructing AMET users to add more monitoring stations into standard AQ networks? Kind of customizing observational database right. with model results. Yeah, and so there, I believe, I believe there is um, instructions in there on how you would do that. Um, essentially what that is, is our, our instructions are well, Look at the format of one of the existing network files and mimic that. Um, and then there's instructions on how you would add that to the code. So um, you could actually, you know, take some other network and I've laid out instructions on how you would go ahead and do that. Um, and as I said early on, one of the changes I made with this kind of dynamically coming up with the uh, tables, that makes that process a lot easier because you don't have to go in there and manually add different species for each one. It does it on the fly. So the short answer to that is there are instructions in the user's guide on how you would go ahead and do that. Mm -hmm. On yeah. a related note, Wyatt, uh, do you have tools to convert, um, say, data from Europe to AMET ready format and do you plan to share them with the community? Um, so I think that's a good question. Um, I would say that we don't deal with the Europe networks that much. So I don't, I personally don't have those tools. Um, actually Christian Hogriff has been integral in getting, uh, doing the processing of those data. So I can follow up with him and see if he thinks that there are some of the tools that he's written that could be provided. Um, to do that. A, a lot of it is probably not written quite in a user-friendly format yet because it's not something we plan on kind of releasing publicly, but if there's enough interest in those things, 
um, I'm sure we'd be happy to share what we have once we get it into a format that's not going to, you know, frustrate people. Um, I personally would love to just provide those data, but we've we've kind of had communications with the data providers for some of those networks, and they would prefer that we um, send people to the source and get those data that way. So. Um, Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, here's a very broad question. Um, why also, can you elaborate on plans to incorporate remote sensing data to ops data set supported by AML? Um, so, yeah, I don't, this is new. So I, we definitely want to incorporate the remote sensing. Um, I think we're still formulating exactly how we're going to do that. So I'm not sure which data set we'll start with. So we haven't even got to that point, something simple that's probably easy, easy to use. Um, and then exactly how we do that, I'm not sure, because the satellite data, as I said, they pose kind of a unique problem, um, because whereas networks have sites, you know where they are, they don't move around, they're just fixed there. Satellite data obviously are a bit unique in that you're not really dealing with sites, you're dealing with grid cells. So. Um, we still have to figure out how we're going to do that going forward, but it is certainly um, kind of top on my list of doing that um, because I think that's a really valuable source of data that we're not using yet. So I don't think that it quite answered the question, but we just we haven't figured out that plan yet, unfortunately. Okay, but at least it's good to hear that you do. No, yeah, we're thinking about it. It is on our list of things to do. We just have to come up with a plan on how to do it. Yeah. Um, what's the latest year you have? I think you touched upon that, but maybe to clarify, I right. think you heard you have air quality for 2017. Yeah, so there's definitely 2017 data there. I would, I would probably caution people that, you know, these data do get updated sometimes, um, especially, you know, data from CSN and Improve and things like that. Um, so I generally go through a few iterations of that before I would call it kind of quote unquote final data. Um, but yeah, currently there are data there for 2000 through 2017. Um, I think internally I have 2018 data, but have not gotten to a point where I'd be comfortable putting them out quite yet since they are incomplete at this point. Okay. So, yeah. Can multiple versions of AMET coexist on the same machine? Yeah, um, yes, yeah. I mean, you could do, yeah, and I, I myself have different versions of AMET. You know, I have a kind of a public version, a development version. It's fine for them to be there. Um, they could use the same database, I mean, the same named database, or they could use a different one. Um, yeah, it's fine. It's fine to have multiple versions. Yeah, I don't, I don't see a reason why you could not. And yeah. is there a specific MySQL version we should be using? Um, that's actually a good question. I, I wish I had had the version that we use. Um, I can get that. I think that occasionally we run into some issues with things in MySQL that have changed. Um, I've not run into that recently. Um, but what I could certainly do if we don't do it somewhere in the documentation is list the version of MySQL that we currently use here. And that way someone would know at least what version works. Um, you know, we, we don't control those things. So if, if someone got the latest version and something changed, um, we would just like to know about it. You know, someone could post that to the users forum or something like that. So we could address that going forward. But um, I would just say, hopefully the latest version that's out there works, but we'll post the version that we use. Yeah, that yeah. sounds a reasonable approach. Uh, okay. Um, can these be used in Python? This is sort of a little open-ended question. Yeah. Um, I don't know much about Python. So it's, um, you know, I got, I did started doing this 15 years ago and R was the really cool thing to be working in. So, um, so I did R. Um, I think that going forward, again, going forward, Python is something we want to look into because a lot of new tools, really cool stuff is being written in Python. Um, so I think that Rob and I may look at how we could 
um, use that going forward. I don't know that we would kind of rewrite everything, but maybe we can leverage some of the things in Python and write some some interesting code in Python. So I don't have a good answer to that question because I don't I don't I don't know. But if someone out there has done it, please let others know. I would that would be um, my advice. You could you could certainly use Python to uh, connect to your you know AMET database and uh, you know have fun that way. Uh, but uh, you know we're, like Wyatt said, we're looking in the you know seeing if there's any advantage to to Python over what we have now in R. Yeah, yeah. I think maybe one of the advantages I don't know about Python it might be the speed side of things. Perhaps it can do some of these things quicker. I don't know. Making things quicker is always a big thing. No one ever complains when things work faster. So. <laughs> yeah, I think the bottom line is you've written it in R, and that's what it is, and there's no reason yeah. somebody well, that's, to work with Python, right? Yeah, but if Python, you know, if there's a lot of Python out there now, and if there's things that make sense to use, you know, you maybe Rob and I are old, but maybe we can be taught a new trick. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> Thank you. Um, is it possible to keep model of histogram side by side? Um, I'm trying to see what the question is. So it's basically you, you generate them independently, but is there one script that does them both? Um, that's a good question. So both Rob and I have histogram plots. Um, I think I think I do have a histogram plot in AMET that will do side by side, but don't quote me on that. It's, I, I will admit the histogram is one of the ones that I've not looked at in a while. Um, it's, it's probably one that I should look at and maybe update. Um, so I guess the, the answer to that is maybe, um, and that if not, it's probably something that's, that's easily done. Um, yeah, I think for years, Rob, you just yeah, have but, histograms of model and histograms of ops. Yeah, yeah, yeah they're. Uh, Kind of stacked on top of each other in the meteorology uh, example that I had yeah. for both short wave radiation and relative humidity. Uh, okay. Um, here's another one. Is st this may be for uh, Rob? Is Rob, yeah. the column included in the observation metadata of MET part of AMET? Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> there you go. And I think we missed uh, Uma's question. Um, I think uh, why kind of yeah, on the you got that. That. yeah, I think that yeah, to answer Uma's question specifically, I don't know yet. It's something I want to look into. Um, so yeah, I think we we kind of covered it there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I felt. You, you all are still yeah. thinking about that yep. in terms of specific products and and the timeline. So yep. Okay. Um, I think <laughs> we got them all. Any other comments from? You all, Rob, what? Um, I would just say, you know, if we feedback is great, and if people, you know, run into issues, please, you know, post it. Don't. Uh, I would say, you know, hopefully you don't run into issues, but if you do, don't give up. Post something. Uh, for example, this the error I talked about. I, I mean, I was, I hadn't heard about it before today, so maybe just people hadn't gotten to it yet, but. My worry is that people tried it, run into a problem, and then kind of said, eh, you know. So um, I would just encourage people that we're here to support it. Um, happy to, you know, certainly want people to use it and make it easier to use. And, um, you know, are, are very open to feedback and making things more useful and, and working better. So I would just um, say, you know, feedback is always welcome. I don't know, Rob? Yeah, uh, along the same lines, uh, any any analyses or any observational data sets that people find uh, are useful in their work, uh, uh, we'd appreciate uh, you know feedback on possibly including those in, in the next version of AMAT. So, okay. Um, thank you very much, Rob White. I do have one announcement for next time. Um, White, I tried to send you a request to. Oh, I can approve that. Yep. Yep. Okay. Okay. It's all yours. That's okay. Thank you. Yep.
Okay. I just want to announce our next webinars coming up on December 18th at 2 p.m. And this will be given by Professor Peter Adams of Carnegie Mellon. And this will be a small tutorial session on introduction to reduce complexity models for air quality. Thank you all for joining today and uh, hope to see all of you in a month from now. Thank you. Thanks.